Hey everyone, today we are going to go over our populations chapter. This is in chapter 5 of our textbook. When we go into a town and we see that green sign and the population underneath it, that's the number of humans that live within that city's city limits since the last census. And so when we give population a definition, we say that it consists of all the individuals of that species that live in a particular place at a particular time. And one of the things about this is that this number can certainly change. We talk about like how a town might change based on whether it has school or no school. It might change based on births or deaths. It might change on people moving in, people moving out. But in biology, this is a much more fluid situation because there are no borders, there are no restrictions. Um, and so we get a lot of that change that can happen. The other thing that we say is that populations are the smallest unit that is able to evolve. Why can we say that? It's because the genes of the population can change. So we'll talk about those different ways uh, coming up momentarily in this video. One of the first phrases that we talk about is what we call population density. So that takes a look at a number of individuals in a given area. That area might be a county, it might be a square mile, it might be a square inch if we're talking about like bacteria in a petri dish. In the picture here, we have the population of humans density in the United States. And so we see areas in California like Los Angeles and the like that have a very high population density. But then in areas like eastern Montana, a little bit of the Dakotas, it's a much lower population density. And so when we look at human population, that's a science called demographics. And business owners use that a lot. Politicians use that a lot but it gives a way to figure out how many people are living in a given area. We also, next we'll take a look at population dispersion. So that's how populations arrange themselves in space. This can be seasonal, for example, like during the mating season or during the winter, or when the conditions are excellent, you might have populations that vary in space. The most popular one that we have in biology is the clumped or grouped. A lot of things live in colonies, or packs or troops. The next most common that we actually see is even, and this is when we have kind of resources that are a little bit more scarce and they're kind of fighting for that area. So we'll see this with like groves of trees, pine trees, especially spruce trees and those different kinds of species, but also in penguins with uh, guarding nesting sites. And then random is our least common, but we see these sometimes in our predatory animals, like some of our birds of prey, eagles, red-tailed hawks, um, sharks, those types of things. And so if we look at this in terms of people, we can say that, you know, we have even, so if we're sitting in like nice even rows, we could say that we're random. If we looked at like maybe a city or a wider scale, we could also say that we're clumped. Maybe we look at different households or apartment complexes. So again, just because it shows a dispersion of one type, it just doesn't mean it's in there for its entire life. So when we look at some examples real quick, clumped, we have schools of fish, we have packs of wolves, hives of bees. With even, we have pine trees or spruce trees. Anything that involves agriculture, usually we like it in nice even rows, um, whether we're talking about corn, soybeans, or the sunflowers in this case. And then also, if we're talking about some of those higher populated dense areas with like nesting sites or territorial creatures, we would see it in this example with penguins. And then our random are some of our predator creatures because they need a lot more area in order to survive and do what they do. Um, and so sharks and grizzly bears and some of our forests that have even distribution of resources, we would see this random type. Next, let's talk about the different types of curves that we see within populations. So originally scientists thought that populations could go on and on and on and on forever but we know that Earth only has so many resources, and so that has kind of gone by the wayside, although we do still see that initial rapid growth once that population has been established. Instead, though, we see that leveling off, and the reason for that leveling off is the running out of resources, the basic needs, food, water, space, and shelter, and that's why that leveling will change based on seasons. If you have a really, really good season, you might have that carrying capacity go up. If you have drought, maybe you see that population number level off a little bit sooner than what it has in years prior. And so that's a big vocab word that we have is carrying capacity. So it's the total number of species that an area can sustain 
that's kind of a key word. So basically, will it remain healthy at that population? And so um, the things that cause that leveling off collectively are called density dependent factors. So these are things that organisms have to have or things that will change based on what that number is. So for example, if you don't have enough food, water, space, shelter, that number is going to go down. You would also be influenced by competition, like what you're seeing here with these two bighorn ram sheep. And the other thing that we might see, and we're seeing this a little bit with our, our pandemics, is the higher the population, the more likely it is for transmission to occur. And so all of those things are called density dependent factors. Density independent factors, however, these are things that are going to happen to the area that change the population no matter what. Think natural disasters with these. So you could have, for example, a forest fire, an avalanche, weather, climate changes, all of those. Um, sometimes disease, famine might also be related to this, but this is more so a density dependent factor that we would see with those. So um, they're going to change the population, but they're not things that the population requires in order to go up or down. As we talked about a lot in class, biology has two main goals, to stay alive and to reproduce. And this slide shows our two different strategies of biology and how they go about increasing their number. The small letter R strategists, they are our simpler creatures. And their goal is to have as many babies as possible or lay as many eggs as possible, but basically leave their young on their own. And there's very little parental care, if at all. They usually mature super quick. So for example, they might go through puberty in like a day or a week and be able to create more right away. K strategists with a capital letter K, their approach is longer lives, taking longer time to mature. And then when they are able to have offspring, the ones that they have, they're not gonna have as many, but the ones that they do have are gonna be successful. So these would be a lot of our mammals, a lot of our birds, some amphibians, some reptiles. Um, and then there's also some plants and some other smaller creatures, but those are usually our more advanced creatures that, uh, that show a K strategist approach. Next thing in our chapter is how our population's genetics change. So just kind of a little thing you can reflect on, and we talked about this in class, but if you build a wall around Goodhue, what kind of people do you have? Well, you have blue collar people, you have people that typically are Caucasian with some Hispanic and other racial descents. You have ethnicities like Irish and German as the predominant ones. You also can talk about the different types of religions. But when we talk about walls, that's not what happens in biology. Things are allowed to free or move pretty freely. So things that can change a population's genetics are mutations, which happen to all creatures at different rates, of course. You can have things move in and out called gene flow, genetic drift, non-random mating, and natural selection. So now let's kind of dive into each of those. Mutations can be good, bad, or indifferent. But what it means is that they are heritable. They can be passed on. There are changes that happen at the genetic level or DNA level, as we've talked about, and they're going to change what the creature looks like to a certain point. Sometimes those mutations are good, bad, indifferent, but they still give variety. And if those mutations do provide a benefit, they're going to be more likely to be found in that population, thus changing the genes. The next one is gene flow, and this is what we see the, the most of. This is when creatures are moving into or out of the population. So for example, we talked about how some migratory birds might be windblown off their uh, migration pattern and might end up in some place that they're not normally. And so that can change what was typically found in that area. Same thing with some of our insects that break dormancy. Um, there's a whole bunch of different examples, but because creatures are allowed to move freely within, you can change the genes of that population. The next one is non-random mating. We did an activity with this where we said, what do you look like or what do you look for in a man or a woman? And so, you know, that's kind of a game that we played. But in real biology, if we take this example, let's say if we're a female white-tailed deer and we have our option between this big boy with a nice set of antlers, strong neck, nice body, and wimpy little Bambi here. If you're a female doe deer, which one are you going to go after? You betcha. This guy looks a lot more appealing, a lot more dominant. So what does that mean? 
his genes are more likely to stay in the population where Wimpy Bambi, sorry about it, but your genes probably aren't going to be found in the population, or at least not this year. So what that does is certain genes are going to be more prevalent in the population because of that. Probably the least one that, uh, or the least easily to explain is genetic drift. And if you look, it's just kind of showing you the randomness in which a population become, can become more dominant or more recessive, and there's no real influence behind it. And we talked about how humans naturally have gotten taller over time, even though evolutionarily there's not really an advantage of being tall. And then the last one that we'll talk about is natural selection. We talked about this a lot last chapter, but what this means is that if there are genes that are better to have, and if that increases their survivorship or increases their ability to have mates, they're going to be stronger in that population. And so uh, there's many examples of this, but if we look at our peppered moths and, you know, what kind of tree they might have, uh, you know, with the habitat, they're going to blend in depending on if they're in a light tree environment or if pollution has happened and it's soot covered and they become dark tree. So we would just see how those numbers of populations would change based on each scenario. There are three different kinds of selection. You have directional selection, and that is where it's not uh, necessarily good to have one of the phenotypes. And so it become, in this case, more popular to be either big A, little a, or big A, big A. Stabilizing selection is where it's not good to be little a, little a, or big A, big A. That's sometimes called a heterozygous advantage, so we see that middle go up. And then the other one that we looked at was called a disruptive selection, and that's where instead of it being a black bell-shaped curve, it actually inverts itself, and so it's not good to be the heterozygous. It's good to be on those opposites at opposite ends. Um, and so some real examples of this would be like a wild boar that feeds on a cacti. The cacti, the more spines it has, the more likely it is to live because it's not getting eaten by the wild boar. And so that's an advantage. It's a directional selection. And so we'd see those genes uh, more likely to happen. And then another example would be with bird beaks. And we saw this a lot with Darwin. So let's say that it's an insect eater. It's not good to be a big bulky beak. So we would see a shift that would see higher over here. And if it was not good to be have a little narrow beak, we would see it, it down here and then up here. And so sometimes events, if enough of those changes add up, you can get new species that are created. And so that's our recap on populations. And so if you have any questions, make sure that you email me. But this has been a recap of Chapter 5 on populations and the different things that happen. Thanks for tuning in.